All right, well, greetings. Thank you for joining this class. As Pastor Terrence has said, we're gonna be talking about angels and the topic of angelology includes not just the holy angels, but it includes Satan and the demons. We'll have five sessions together. And I wanna encourage you, don't run and do it right now, but for the next four sessions, if you don't have a printed Bible on hand, I encourage you to bring one. Um, you know, when you study the Bible, it's always better to use a printed Bible rather than just your phone. It's wonderful to have the Bible on your phone, to have it handy with you wherever you go. But when you're studying the Word of God, it's always helpful to have a printed Bible. Now, let's see if things are going to work. Do you see a blue slide? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's I'm see how this mute. works. All right. Okay. Why is angelology important and what exactly is it? Well, angelology is the study of all angelic beings. And when we say angelic, we don't mean angelic in the sense of being good. We mean the entire category of the created invisible spirit beings. That includes the holy angels, it includes demons and it includes Satan. Now, some theologians would break this up into angelology, demonology, and Satanology, but we're gonna put it all together under that one umbrella. Angelology is important because angels are real. They are part of the created world. Uh, they are present, they are all around us, and angels have important roles in God's program. Now, as we're going to see, um, not so much today, but in, in our sessions in the future, we need to be vigilant toward the fallen angels. The fallen angels are powerful, they can be dangerous, and they're highly deceptive. On the other hand, we should be comforted because of the presence of the holy angels. God often uses angels to help people usually not in ways that are visible to us, but they do have a role in our lives. Now, let's look at the biblical terms that identify angels. Click. All right. The Hebrew term for angel is malak. This is the same Hebrew word that you see in the book Malachi. Now, malaki, the title of that book means my angel or my messenger. And Malachi was not an angel, he was a human. It's very important to understand that the Hebrew term for angel, Malak, doesn't technically mean an invisible spirit being. It simply means an agent, a messenger. And the same thing is true for the Greek term for angel, which is angelos. It sounds very much like our English word. Both of these terms mean a messenger or an agent. Now, the beings that we call agent, uh, call angels are messengers or agents of God. If they are the holy angels, the fallen angels are obviously battling against him. Now, since these are not technical terms in the Bible, in other words, since Moloch and Angelos do not always mean an invisible spirit being, when we see those words in the Bible, we have to be careful how we understand them. Uh, for example, in the seven letters to the churches in Revelation chapter two and three, depending on which Bible translation you're reading, um, Jesus addresses the church by saying something like this, to the angel of the church of Ephesus, to the angel of the church in Smyrna. Now, the word there is angelos, but it doesn't necessarily mean an invisible spirit being. Many expositors, and I'm one of them, think that the angel of each of one of these churches is actually the pastor of the church. That pastor is a human, and he is a messenger in the sense that he speaks to the people of that church for God. Now, let's talk about the creation and the organization of the angels. 
Colossians 1.16 is a very important verse. Speaking of Christ, Paul says, For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. Now, as we'll see in a little bit, these phrases, thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers, that's a listing of the invisible things that Paul refers to in this verse. Those are titles or categories of angels. Now, what do we know about the angels? Well, first of all, we know that their number is fixed. Let's take a look at Matthew chapter 22, verse 30. Right? The Sadducees asked Jesus a question about the resurrection. They're trying to trap him with a question about a woman who married seven brothers after each of the former ones had died. And they say, whose wife of the seven will she be? Jesus answers, you are mistaken, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels of God in heaven. Now, this is one piece of evidence that suggests that angels don't reproduce. And so if the angels were all created by Christ, and if they don't reproduce, that means that their number is fixed. There will never be any more angels than there are now. Now, that's the same concept that we see in Colossians 1.16, putting them together. They're created. They're non-reproducing. They're not born. Angels don't come into the world as little tiny angels and grow up into be big angels. They were created exactly as they are. Now, another important point is that angels don't die. Let's take a look at Luke chapter 20, verse 36. Here we have a little bit longer answer to the same question that we were looking at in Matthew. Jesus says, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are counted worthy to attain that age and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, nor can they die anymore, for they are equal to the angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. Now, we need to be very careful with this verse. Let me read verse 36 again, and I want you to listen very carefully. Nor can they die anymore. For they are equal to the angels and are sons of God, being sons of resurrection. Now, when Jesus says that in resurrection life, we will be equal to the angels, it doesn't mean that we will become angels. The only equality that he's talking about here is the fact that like the angels who cannot die, they were created that way, once we get to resurrection life, we will not be able to die either. So getting back to the angels, they were created, they're not born, they don't reproduce, and they don't die. That means that the number has been unchanging, and every angel that exists has been around for a very long time. In fact, longer than the time that this universe has existed. Now in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22, and Revelation 5, 11, I, I won't turn to those passages right now. The number of the angels is described by the Greek word myriad. And myriad means a very, very large number. It, it's not a specific number like million or billion, but it means many, many angels. Now, you may have noticed, in at least in the English translation, most Bibles talk about the host of heaven. In the Old Testament, you see the host of heaven in uh, Luke. When angels come to announce the birth of Jesus, we're told that there is a heavenly host there. Well, that word host is a rather old-fashioned word that basically means a huge number. It's typically used to describe an army. And there's a sense in which the angels, the holy angels at least, who are still obedient to God, are an army of servants, and in many cases, 
what they participate, participate in is a kind of spiritual warfare. Now, the next thing that we need to understand about the organization of the angels is that they're organized hierarchically. Take a look again at Colossians 1.16, which is on your screen. For, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. We're going to look at those four words a little bit later, but those four words suggest an organization that is very much like an army. As any army has generals, captains, lieutenants, corporals, privates, it seems that the angels, both the angels of God and probably the angels of Satan, are organized into a hierarchy. There's a structure of authority. Some angels are higher, some angels are lower. And the picture that we get is that they work together, the holy angels work together to accomplish the tasks that God assigns to them, and the fallen angels work together to accomplish the tasks that Satan assigns to them. Now, it's a funny thing. I can't see the heading on my screen because it's blocked here, but I think I know what it says. We're going to look at um, designations of angels or classifications of angels. Now, it's surprising. There are not a lot of angels who are identified by name in Scripture. One of them is Michael the Archangel. Now, Michael the Archangel, according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, is going to announce the rapture. Michael is mentioned in Jude 9. Um, in Daniel chapter 10, Michael appears. Uh, let's take a look at Daniel chapter 10. If you have your Bible, please turn there. And we're going to be looking at verse 20 and 21. An angel appears to Daniel to speak to him of future events. And in verse 20, the angel says, do you know why I've come to you? And now I must return to fight with the prince of Persia. We'll talk about the prince of Persia later. And when I have gone forth, indeed, the prince of Greece will come, but I will tell you what is noted in the scripture of truth. And then he throws in this parenthetical comment, no one upholds me against these except Michael, your prince. Michael seems to be a very powerful holy angel. He seems to serve as a guardian of Israel. And then the other angel who is named in a few places is the angel Gabriel. Now we see Gabriel in Daniel chapter 8 and Daniel chapter 9. Gabriel appears to give interpretations of visions to Daniel in those two chapters. And then in Luke chapter 1, Gabriel is involved in announcing the birth of Christ. Gabriel seems to have a special role as a revealer of prophecy and as a herald of important events. Now, moving on, the next kind of angel, the next classification of angel that we know about from the Bible are the, the angels called cherubim. Now, you may know that in Hebrew, when you see a word that ends with im, it's usually a plural. Cherubim is actually plural of the word cherub. The cherubim appear in the vision in Ezekiel 1 and 2. They appear in Revelation 4, 6 to 9. There seem to be four very special angels. They've got wings. Each one has four faces. They're usually around the throne of God. They seem to be very, very special, very powerful angel, angels. Um, by the way, we won't do it right now, but if you look up the vision in Ezekiel chapter 1 and 2 and read about the cherubim, you won't see the word cherubim there. You actually have to go to Ezekiel chapter 10 to find the word cherubim, but there they are identified. Now, the next kind of angel that we see in the Bible 
are called the seraphim or the seraphs in English. If you have your Bible, you might want to turn to Isaiah chapter 6. Let me read just a little bit here. Isaiah chapter 6, starting with verse 1. In the year the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. There's that plural of seraph. Each one had six wings, with two he covered his feet, with two he covered his face, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. One of the seraphim will fly to touch the lips of Isaiah with a coal to symbolically cleanse him to serve as God's prophet. Now the word seraphim seems to mean the burning ones in Hebrew. There's a strong possibility that the seraphim are just another name for the cherubim, but we're not entirely sure of that. Now, all of the types of angels that we've looked at so far are holy angels. These are angels who are obedient to God. Now, moving forward, in Daniel chapter 10, there's a reference to chief princes. And the little bit of Daniel chapter 10 that I read to you earlier, we saw a reference to the prince of Persia and the prince of Greece. These seem to be descriptions of in this case, powerful fallen angels who are associated with Gentile kingdoms. Now, Michael is called the Prince of Israel. He's a holy angel, but the Prince of Persia and the Prince of Greece seem to be fallen angels who are associated with those empires. Now, I don't know whether all of you are old enough to remember it, and I was never a video game player, but I do recall that there was a video game called Prince of Persia. And that title came from the book of Daniel. It was probably a reference to a demon. Uh, as we'll see later, fallen angels, unholy angels are most likely the same as demons. Now, here we come to the classifications of angels that we saw in the book of Colossians. We have Rule, there's the, I'm sorry, there's the Greek term arche, which is translated in some Bibles as rulers, in other Bibles as principalities. This kind of angel, this classification probably refers to both the holy and the fallen angels. And it seems to refer to a role or a place in this hierarchy of holy angels on one side and fallen angels on the other side. Then we have the Greek word exousia which is sometimes, sometimes translated as authorities or powers. Um, this might refer to a level of authority within the hierarchy, or it may refer to special capabilities of this kind of angel. And we've got the next kind of angel, which is called a power. This term also appears in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. This word, dunamis, seems to emphasize the fact that angels have abilities that go far beyond human abilities. Angels are able to do a number of things that we can't do. Obviously, they are invisible under normal circumstances. They can move quickly. We'll talk about some of these a little bit later. Whoops, I don't know why all three of those came up, but that's fine. Um, then we've got dominions, another classification. We've got thrones. And then we've got the very last category. Now, let me finish up talking about powers, authorities, dominions, and thrones, and then we'll move on to the last category, angel of Yahweh. Those four categories describe what are truly angels, created invisible spirit beings. Now, the last category that appears on the table is the phrase angel of Yahweh. It's usually translated in an English Bible, angel of the Lord, where capital L-O-R-D, those are all capital letters. It's a very interesting study, and you might want to do it sometime, to just go through your Old Testament 
and look at the different places where you see that phrase, angel of the Lord. In most cases, that phrase does not refer to what we mean when we speak of angels. In most cases, it seems to be describing what theologians call a theophany. A theophany is an event where God makes himself visible in a way that people can see. For example, one of the most, theophany, most uh, important theophanies in the Old Testament is when Moses, in Exodus chapter 3, sees the burning bush. And he turns aside to see the burning bush, and the voice of God comes out of the bush. We're told there that he sees the angel of the Lord, but this is most likely not a created spirit being. It's most likely God appearing in a visible form for the benefit of Moses. Um, I won't go into detail in it right now, but let me simply say that in most cases, um, let me back up and say this more carefully. In the cases in the Old Testament where the phrase angel of the Lord describes a theophany, it seems to be the case that in every one of those, the person of the Trinity who is appearing is the pre-incarnate Christ. Now, you may ask, how do we know that? Well, we have a very strong hint in John chapter 1, verse 18. And you should know that in John chapter 1, when you see the word God, it's referring to God the Father. John 1, 18 says this, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father has declared him or has made him visible, has made him evident. Now, John 1.18 seems to be saying that God the Father has never appeared in a visible form, and yet there are many places in the Old Testament where people do see God. Now, those times when they see God are theophanies, and since those theophanies are told, we're told here that it's not God the Father, then it is probably the pre-incarnate Christ. All right, well, let's move forward. Let's talk about the characteristics of the angels. And remember, right now we're talking about all of the angels, the holy angels, the fallen angels. And I'm sure you know this, but let me state the obvious. There was a time when all of the angels were unfallen, when all of the angels were holy. God created them all good and all holy. There was an event where a number of them rebelled against God's authority and they became what we call the fallen angels. All right, well, let's consider the characteristics of angels. Now, broadly speaking, angels are personal beings. Now, I can't see your faces and I can't hear your voices, but I'm going to ask you a question and you don't have to answer it out loud. I'm sure some of you will say yes to what I'm going to ask. If you have a pet, would you say that your pet has a personality? Now, I've had many pets in my life. I don't have any right now. Um, but if you have a dog, if you have a cat, if you have a bird, um, hamsters, whatever they might be, even fish, many people would say that their pets have personalities. And, and I would agree at a certain level that pets do have personalities. To a certain extent, at least the higher animals have a certain amount of intelligence, they feel emotions, and they make choices. But there's something that animals don't have, that humans and angels do have, which makes us very special. Humans and angels are personal beings who have intellect, emotion, will, and a moral nature. In other words, they have a sense of right and wrong. They have a sense of guilt before God when they do wrong and a sense of being right when they do right. Now, if you were to go swimming in the ocean and a shark were to come up and bite off your leg, that would be bad, but I don't think that you'd want to put the shark in jail. 
You wouldn't say that the shark has sinned. The shark is just doing the kind of things that sharks do. On the other hand, if you're sleeping at the beach and I come up with a chainsaw and cut your leg off, you would definitely say that what I did was evil. It was fundamentally wrong and I should be punished. Well, that distinction between animals on the one hand, which have a certain degree of personality, and humans and angels on the other hand, who have all of the characteristics of full personhood is very important. To put it another way, human beings and angels have these characteristics that essentially um, amount to bearing the image of God. God is a personal being. He has intellect, emotions, and will. And the moral nature, he is holy, he is good, he is right. And humans and angels are also like that. Now, let's talk about what it means to say that angels are spiritual beings. When we say that angels are spiritual beings, we're saying that they have the ability to interact with God. They can have fellowship with God. They can communicate with God. Um, we're saying a little bit more when we say that they're spiritual beings. Human beings are also spiritual beings, but there's something that we have that angels don't have, and that is a permanent physical body. Angels don't seem to have permanent physical bodies. They have the capability to appear in physical form, and they had the capability to even interact with the physical world. But under normal circumstances, they're invisible. Under normal circumstances, they don't seem to have physical bodies. Now, in Hebrews chapter 1, there's a very interesting statement. In fact, Hebrews chapter 1 is sort of a collection of Old Testament statements regarding angels. The very last verse of the chapter says something quite interesting. Speaking of angels, the author says, Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? Now we'll talk a little bit later about what this verse is saying in particular about the roles of angels. But it's very clear that angels are spirits. Now moving forward, as we've already seen, angels are don't reproduce. Click. Okay, we've seen that angels are immortal. Now, this is very important. Angels are capable of being in God's presence. In fact, they're capable of going into and out of God's presence. Let's take a look at Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1, verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. That's very interesting. We're obviously much later in history than the fall of Satan. Satan certainly fell into sin and rebellion against God long before Genesis chapter 3, and this is hundreds of years later and Satan is going into the presence of God. The sons of God also come to present themselves before God, and those sons of God here may be fallen angels. Now, even though Satan is fallen, even though he is sinful, he's capable of being in God's presence, and he apparently goes frequently into God's presence. That's probably why the book of Revelation calls Satan the accuser of the brethren. It's a rather disturbing thought to think that when we as believers have fallen into sin, there's a strong likelihood that Satan or one of the fallen angels goes into the presence of God to point out our sin before him. And then it becomes necessary for the Lord Jesus Christ to stand up and serve as our advocate and intercessor, and to say, yes, David Dean has fallen into sin again, but he has put his trust in me, and my blood covers all of his sins. 
So the angels are capable of being in God's presence. Now here's something that I want you to think about. Angels are immortal. They're intelligent. They're capable of learning. And they're invisible. They can apparently pass through walls. They can travel from place to place quickly. It's a pretty scary thought to think that we have such beings as our enemies. Now, let me read to you a couple of quotations from Charles Ryrie. Ryrie says, speaking of the angels, intelligence can be enhanced by experience. Every demon, of course, has existed throughout all the span of human history, though each one has not observed everything that has transpired through history. Their longevity gives an added dimension to their native intelligence. They have observed human beings in almost every conceivable situation. Therefore, they can accurately predict what individuals will do in most circumstances. Now, I think what Ryrie is focusing, focusing on here is the desire of Satan and his angels to bring believers in particular into tempting situations in which we will fall into sin. But as I think about these characteristics of angels, what comes to my mind, even more importantly, is the ability of angels to deceive. Now, here in Hong Kong, as well as in the Philippines, and in much of Asia, fortune tellers are very common. And I have met people who say that they go regularly to fortune tellers and say that they get good information from fortune tellers. Now, you probably know that Hong Kong is a financial hub. There are many people here, not followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, who are involved in the stock market. And they will frequently go to see fortune tellers and ask, what stock should I invest in tomorrow? What's going up? And the interesting thing is that they often get what they claim is good information. Now stop and ask yourself, how could a fortune teller get that kind of information? Well, if a fortune teller is in fact in contact with invisible spirit beings, and if those invisible spirit beings are able to travel all over the world rapidly, if they've been around since the foundation of this world, they probably know most languages. Think about the information that a fallen angel could gather by flying, say, from Hong Kong over to New York City to listen in on a board meeting of some major company, finding out when there's going to be a stock merger, when there's going to be a new product revealed, something like that. Then the angel comes back gives that information to the fortune teller and the fortune teller passes it on to his client. It's not as crazy as it sounds. And I think when we seriously keep in mind the capabilities of the fallen angels, it really highlights the fact that they can be extremely dangerous and very powerful at deceiving human beings. Let's talk about the powers of angels. Angels are very powerful, but it's very important to understand that they are not omnipotent. Omnipotent means all powerful. They are not omniscient. Omniscient means knowing all things. And they are not omnipresent. Omnipresent means present everywhere at once. Now those three words, omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent, describe the triune God, but they don't describe the angels. Now let's go back to Daniel chapter 10. Very interesting little thing stated here. Daniel chapter 10, verse 13. Well, let's start with verse 12. An angel is speaking to Daniel. Now let's go all the way back to verse 11. The angel says, O Daniel, man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. 
While he was speaking this word to me, I stood trembling. And he said to me, do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before God, your words were heard, and I have come because of those words. Now, if you jump back to verse 2 in this chapter, you find out that it's three weeks since Daniel had begun, begun to pray, and this angel has only shown up now. Listen to verse 13. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. It took this angel 21 days to get from the throne room of heaven to where Daniel was. Now, we don't really understand a lot of the details of spiritual warfare. We don't really know where heaven is. I believe that heaven is in another dimension, that it's not really within the physical universe. I don't think you can get to the throne room of God in a rocket ship, no matter which direction you point it, nor how long you fly. But somehow, it took time for this holy angel to get to Daniel, and part of the reason that it took time is that he was battling against the prince of Persia. Now, what's the point that I'm trying to make here? It's that angels are not omnipresent. An angel can only be in one place at one time. He must move from here to here in order to get here. Even though that is true, angels working together can give the impression of having omnipotence or omniscience or omnipresence when they're trying to defeat human beings, when they're trying to defeat us in particular by deception. Now, for example, um, angels do have powers. They can open locked doors. We see that in Acts chapter 5 when an angel frees Peter from prison. They can possess enormous wisdom. We'll be looking at Ezekiel 28 a little bit later in this course, and we will see that Satan, as he was created, when he was created good, was the wisest of all the angels. Angels can exert great strength. Let's take a look at Matthew chapter 28, verse 2. All right, this is speaking of the day when Christ was discovered to be missing from the tomb. Matthew chapter 28, verse 1. Now, after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene, and the other Mary came to see the tomb, and behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. Now, the stones that were used in front of tombs were extremely heavy. They would take several men, probably using pry bars to move them, and that stone had also been sealed, probably with mortar. But this angel just pushes it aside with no difficulty. Now, Back to the question that we asked a few minutes ago. Let's repeat this again. What kinds of deception might an evil, invisible, immortal, fast-traveling, extremely clever being cooperating with others of his kind be able to foist on unsuspecting or gullible humans? And the answer is all kinds of deception. All kinds of deception. We really need to watch out for deception from invisible spirit beings who want to deceive us, otherwise known as fallen angels. Well, let's, let's share some thoughts on the status of the angels. The angels are called sons of God in several places in the Old Testament. Oops, I don't know what made that click forward, but it's okay. Um, in Genesis chapter 6, a very interesting passage that we'll look at later. We are told that the sons of God interact with the daughters of men. We've seen in Job chapter 1 that the angels go into the presence of God. Job chapter 38 tells us that all the sons of God were present applauding the creative work of God when God did the work that is recorded in Genesis chapter 1. Now, I think the all in Job 38, 7 is very important. There is a bit of a debate regarding exactly when 
Satan fell and when the other angels who became the fallen angels joined his rebellion, I think Job 38, 7 makes it very clear that the rebellion of the angels, let's see, I've lost my train of thought. Let's come back to that later. Let's come back to that later. All right. Um, the angels are called sons of God, but they're never explicitly said to bear God's image. Now, the Bible does say that we bear God's image, but the very fact that angels are called sons of suggests that they bear God's image. In fact, in the Bible, when you see the phrase son of and then fill in the blank, that usually means that the person who is the son is like the person whose name is in the blank. So in some aspects, at least, angels bear God's image. Now, we are told in Psalm 8 that man is made a little bit lower than the angels. Now, that's a little bit ambiguous. Does that mean that human beings are slightly lower than the angels in their capabilities or something like that? Or is it better translated, lower than the angels for a little bit of time. That's another possible way of understanding it. Whichever one of those is correct, we know from scripture that one day angels will be judged by human beings. Now let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. This chapter opens with Paul rebuking the Corinthians the Corinthian Christians, because they are suing each other. They're taking each other to court over legal matters, over business matters. Paul says in verse 1, Dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters, meaning these little things involving money? Verse 3, do you not know that we shall judge angels? That's a very interesting statement. I assume that the angels that we will judge will be the fallen angels. Not much more is said about that. Now, there's another interesting piece of evidence regarding the status of the angels. And we find that in Jude chapter, not Jude chapter 6, in Jude verse 6. Jude verse 6. Okay, here we are. Let's start with verse 5. Jude says, But I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own habitation, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Now, there's a lot of interesting background to that verse. Simply, what, what I want to point out here is that there's no evidence in Scripture anywhere that the fallen angels can be redeemed. It seems that when angels chose to rebel against God, they made a choice from which there is no going back. The fallen angels are apparently doomed and cannot be saved. Now, I want you to turn your Bible, if you have it, to Deuteronomy chapter 18. We're going to read an extremely important passage. Now, I recognize that this is part of the Mosaic Law, and as Christian believers, we are not under the Mosaic Law as a whole. However, there are many things in the Mosaic Law that do apply to us because they apply to all believers. And actually, what we're going to read here applies not only to all believers, but to all human beings. Listen as I read Deuteronomy 18, starting with verse 9, going down to verse 12. 
when you come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire, or one who practices witchcraft, or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. Now, in particular, the latter things in that list are descriptions of all kinds of procedures and techniques that people use in an attempt to make contact with invisible spirit beings. And certainly, within the category of invisible spirit beings are all of the angels, both holy and fallen. Now, God has said to the Israelites, you must not do any of those things. You must never attempt to make contact with invisible spirit beings. But this prohibition does not apply only to the Israelites. Listen to verse 12. For all who do these things, everyone who does these things, all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord your God drives them out from before you. Now, two things I want you to get here. Make sure you get them. In giving this command to the Israelites, God is making it very clear that there is a world of invisible spirit beings. They are all around us. There's even evidence in the New Testament that they have a particular interest in followers of Jesus Christ. You know, there could be a demon in the room with me or an angel in the room with me or perhaps one in the room with you right now. But we can't see them. And God says we are forbidden to attempt to see them or to contact them or to interact with them in any way. Second thing that I want to point out here is that God says that at least one of the reasons for the conquest, that event in which the Israelites went into the land of Canaan and exterminated the Canaanites, one of the reasons is that they were deeply involved in these kinds of practices. These practices are what we call occultic practices. Now, the names and the techniques for contacting invisible spirit beings may have changed a little bit through history, but not very much. All efforts that are described in this passage fall into one of two categories, basically. One is divination. Divination is the effort to gain information from the hidden spirit world. And the other one is sorcery. Sorcery is the effort to gain power from the hidden spirit world. Essentially, all occultic practices, the things that are described here, witchcraft, casting spells, um, seances, uh, things like that, they're all, in, they're all attempts to gain either information or power from the hidden spirit world. And God absolutely forbids human beings to do that. God doesn't say that it's fake. He doesn't say that it's not real. He doesn't say that fortune tellers are phonies, although certainly some of them are. But some of them aren't. And God forbids that we participate in any kind of sorcery or divination. Whoops. Let me back up again. Okay. Okay. Now, it's interesting. Let's turn to Colossians chapter 2. We've got just a few minutes left here, and we're doing fine. Colossians chapter 2. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Come. Pages of my Bible are sticking together. All right. Colossians chapter 2, starting with verse 16. Paul says, Ooh, let's back up for a minute. Let's go back to verse 13. 
Colossians 2.13, and you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with Christ, having forgiven all your trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of the requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Now, that's a great statement of the salvation that we have through Jesus Christ. And Paul continues, having disarmed principalities and powers, remember those phrases? It's talking about fallen angels. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Now, the it here is the cross. And Paul is saying that when Christ gained his victory over death on the cross, he took away the most powerful tool that the fallen angels have for enslaving human beings, and that is the fear of death. Now, Paul continues in verse 16, Therefore, let no one judge you in food or in drink, or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. Let no one defraud you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Now, the point that I want to make here is that while Scripture makes it clear that angels are real, that they're powerful, that the fallen angels are dangerous, and that the holy angels are our allies in many ways, God seems to want to de-emphasize their important in, importance in our eyes. We should be aware that they exist. We should be comforted that God uses the holy angels on our behalf. But we should not get highly excited about angels. We should never be praying to angels, as we'll see later. We should simply be aware that they are there, and more importantly, beware of the danger of spiritual deception. Now, I want to finish by going through a quick discussion of the ministries of the holy angels. We won't go into much detail here because I think you're familiar with most of these things. The angels minister to God. They praise and worship God. We see that in Revelation chapter 5. They give zealous service to God. That's mentioned in Hebrews chapter 1. They are involved in warfare against Satan. We saw that in Daniel chapter 10 against Satan and his agents. The angels applauded God's creative work. And the angels appear before God and report to God. We saw that in Job chapter 1. Now, Angels will also be involved at the future second coming of Christ. The archangel Michael will announce the rapture. Angels will be agents of divine judgment during the tribulation as they participate in the outpouring of judgment upon the people of the earth. Angels will accompany Christ at his second coming when he returns to the earth. Angels will be involved in separating the wheat from the tares. That's probably referring to the sheep and the goats judgment. Angels are also involved in ministering to Israel and the world at large. Angels were involved in the interpretation of the visions that were given to Daniel. We've seen that Michael is the special protector of Israel. And then Daniel chapter 4 has this vague reference to the watchers. Now, the watchers are never specifically identified in scripture, but it seems that they are probably angels, and they seem to supervise important national and historic events. Now, angels are also involved in ministering to the unrighteous. They announced coming judgment. They announced the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah. They will announce the judgment of the people on the earth during the future tribulation. They sometimes are involved in imposing judgment. Second Kings and Isaiah talk about the time when an angel killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. In Acts chapter 12, we're told that angels were involved in uh, judging 
one of the Herods, if I recall correctly. Um, angels will be involved in separating the righteous from the unrighteous, as we just saw. Now, angels also minister to Christian believers. We're told that they provide general aid in Hebrews 1.14 to those who will inherit salvation. That seems to be you and I before we were saved and other people before they were saved. Now, we won't look at it here, but if you want some homework, go look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 19. Angels were somehow involved in the preparation of Scripture. Angels sometimes execute answers to prayer. The saints were praying for the freeing of Peter from prison, and an angel participated in that. And angels observe God's wisdom in the church. This is a fantastic, fascinating topic. I'm not sure we'll get to it in this course. You might want to write these passages down. 1 Corinthians 4.9, 1 Corinthians 11.10, Ephesians 3.10. And sometimes, on, in rare cases, angels have been involved in directing believers in ministry. Here are a number of verses from the book of Acts. Now, I think we'll stop here. I will turn things over to Pastor Terrence, and if you have questions, we can discuss those questions. Thank you, Dr. D. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, we, we will, I have several questions here uh, that people okay. wrote in. Uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, but before we do, let's do the question and answer. And after the question and answer, we would like to ask everyone to put on their video, uh, video on so that we can take a picture. Okay. okay. Uh, here are the questions. Uh, are angels created in God's image? Okay. Excellent question. We this talked a little bit about it. this. Uh, we talked about this a little bit already. Scripture never specifically says that the angels are created in God's image. But if, if we look at Genesis chapter 1 and we explore what it means to be created in God's image for human beings, it seems to mean that we are like God both in our essence and in our activities. We see that human beings have intellect, we have emotion, we have will, and we have a moral nature, as God does. And we see also in Genesis chapter 1 that human beings create, they relate, and they exercise authority. Now, human beings create from what already exists. God can create from nothing. Human beings have relationships with each other. We have relationships with God. We have relationships with animals. We have relationships with the earth. And we exercise authority. And evidence suggests that angels do all of those kinds of things and that angels have the same kinds of characteristics. So although the Bible never says that angels are created in the image of God, they certainly share many of the characteristics that we have that fit into the idea that we're made in the image of God. And since angels are called sons of God repeatedly in the Old Testament, I think it's pretty safe to say that angels do bear the image of God. Okay. Uh, the second question uh, is, uh, I'll... I'll Bring in the two questions. There are two questions that are uh, almost similar. Uh, Jehovah okay. Witnesses believe that Jesus is an archangel who came to earth and bring God's message and eventually went back to heaven to God. Is this biblically correct? Did our Lord born of a man then upgraded to an angel then back to being a deity? Mm -hmm. uh, that is Jehovah Witness. The other one is Mormon. Uh, claim that the first angel to be created is Moroni. Hence, its importance and its significance in their belief as compared to Jesus. What can Christians say about that? Mm, okay. Well, the basic answer to both of those questions is that Scripture makes it very clear that Christ is not created. Christ is the Creator. Let's go to John chapter 1. It's interesting that you bring this up because... A few years ago, my wife and I and some friends were 
visiting Seoul, Korea. And they all went into a store to buy some souvenirs. And I was waiting outside and a couple of ladies dressed up like local tour guides came up to talk to me and they were Jehovah's Witnesses. And they proceeded to try to explain their idea that Jesus is a created being. And I took them to John chapter one, verse one. Now let me read the first three verses and then explain them to you. John chapter one. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him, nothing was made that was made. Now in order to understand this passage, we have to use a lot of logic. Verse one, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Now the first time you read that, it sounds illogical. How can something be with something else and this thing is that other thing? In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Wait a minute, you can't be with yourself. Now what John is doing is he's using the word God there in that sentence in two different ways. When he says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God, he's using God there as God the Father. And when then when he says, and the word was God, he's using the word God as an adjective, meaning divine. Now, you will sometimes run into Jehovah's Witnesses who will say, in Greek, this says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was a God. Now that's a misapplication of Greek translation. In English, you can say book, a book, the book. But Greek doesn't have a. Greek only has book and the book. So when Greek says the word was God, it could be translated, the word was a God, or it could be translated, was having the characteristics of deity. And that is, in fact, what it means. Now, look at verse 2. He was in the beginning with God. That tells us that the word is a person. And then verse 3 is really the crucial verse. All things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. Now, if everything was made through him and every made thing was made by him, then he is not a made thing. In other words, Christ never came into existence. He's not a created being. The angels are created beings. And since Christ is not a created being, he is one of the eternal divine persons of the Trinity, he can't be an angel. And so, since the creator is eternal, meaning his existence goes backward in time forever as well as forward in time forever, in contrast to all created things which have a beginning in time and then move forward, he is obviously higher than any angel and he is not an angel. Does that answer the question? Thank you for that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next question, sir. Uh, I'll rephrase this question. Uh, in Revelation, uh, it mentions about the 24 elders. Uh, are the 24 elders uh, angels or a group of angels uh, with special responsibilities? Okay. That's a very, very interesting question. Let's take a look at that. Um, Revelation chapter 4, look at verse 9. Whenever the living creatures, and these are apparently the cherubim, give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will... They exist and were created. 
Now, turn over to Revelation chapter 5 and take a look at verse 8. This is after Christ has taken the seven sealed scroll. And now we hear again from the 24 elders. Now, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Now this song, which is sung by the 24 elders, indicates very clearly that whoever these are, they're humans, and they're saved humans. I don't think that this can be angels because there's no evidence that angels can be redeemed. There's no talk of angels ever being redeemed by the blood of Christ. Now that raises the question, well, who exactly are these 24 elders? Now one possibility is that 12 of them, or maybe 13, are the apostles. If it's the 12 apostles, including Matthias and Paul, that would be 13. But who the rest of them are, Specifically, I don't know. But they seem to be redeemed humans who have already died and gone into the presence of Christ in heaven. And that's about all I can say. But they're not angels. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Uh, I think this, uh, this next question will be answered in the following sessions, but let me raise it up. Are there guardian okay. angels? When God protects us, does he do it himself or delegate the task to angels? Okay, great question. You will, you will be addressing that, right? I will, but it doesn't hurt to talk about it now. Okay. Let's take a look at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14. One more time. Um, well, we'll look at verse 13. But to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? By the way, that's another indication that Christ is not an angel. Verse 14, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? Now, there's, there's a lot of um, interesting theology in this verse. This is a question, but it's in the form of a statement. I'm sorry, this is a statement in the form of a question. The author is saying, the angels are ministering spirits sent forth to minister, minister for those who will inherit salvation. Now, the interesting thing is, if you're already a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, you are no longer in the category of those who will inherit salvation. Before you were saved, you were in that category. But now that you're saved, you're no longer in that category. Now, I can certainly tell you that there were a couple of incidents in my life before I got saved where I was very close to dying. I cannot tell you whether angels were involved in preventing my death, but it's entirely possible that they were. Now, when people talk about guardian angels, they typically have the idea that each human being has an angel assigned to him, and that angel tracks him through his life, protecting him from various dangers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I, I have several difficulties with that idea. Um, this passage and another one that's in Matthew 18, I don't remember exactly which verse it is, are really the only passages in the Bible that seem to suggest anything like a guardian angel. Now, Aside from the fact that there isn't much scriptural evidence for it, the other thing that I would point out is that believers are not protected from the difficulties of life any more than anybody else. We suffer the same difficulties that other people do. Now, can God send angels to help us in difficulties? Absolutely. Um, there's a story in the Old Testament where Elisha, if I recall correctly, is with his servant and they are under threat from a surrounding army, and Elisha enables the servant to see the angels who are around to protect them. 
angels have very often intervened in human history to help people in difficult circumstances. But the idea that every human being has an angel who tracks around after him to prevent, protect him from difficulties, I, I don't see any evidence for that in scripture. And I, I think, I think even if that were true, it would be dangerous for us to know it because we might be tempted to try to talk to our guardian angels. I don't think we have individual guardian angels. And if we do, it's God's business to direct them and to tell them what to do. Um, and, and we shouldn't be doing dangerous things thinking that our guardian angel is going to protect us. So that's about all I can say about guardian angels. All right. Uh, sir, uh, there are uh, several more questions, uh, but I think some of those questions, uh, I'll be reading it to you, uh, but I think some of those questions, uh, you'll be addressing it in the future sessions. You just, uh, mm -hmm. if, uh, you just let us know if you're, if you're answering it or... Okay, uh, sure, hit me. You're postponing it to another session, all right? Okay. Uh, I'll be stringing several questions because it's in similar nature. Since angels are spiritual beings, then in what form do they appear or visible before men? Uh, there are some other, if angels are spiritual beings with no physical body, what can you say about the reference to their wings and feet? Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, no, I, I, th I think those are, those are good questions to address right now. Um, all right, there, there's a really interesting related question. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 6. And we're going to be looking at what is described there as the fifth seal. In Revelation chapter 6, starting with verse 9, this is what we read. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Now let's make sure that we have this picture correct. These are the souls of dead believers who are in the presence of Christ in heaven. They died because of their Christian faith. They were killed by persecutors. And they're calling out to God to take vengeance on those who had killed them. Now, let's look at the answer. Verse 11. And a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. Now, the first thing I want to point out is that in sort of a sick way, this is really funny. It's really funny. They say, Lord, when are you going to judge the people who killed us? And God says, well, hang on, more of your friends have to die first. It's actually rather funny. But the thing that's quite fascinating to me is verse 11 at the beginning, and a white robe was given to each one of them. Now, these are people who are in what theologians call the intermediate state. They have died physically, their spirits are in heaven, and they have not yet experienced resurrection. And yet they have a location. They are under the throne, and there's some sense in which they're able to wear clothing. They're not just little eyeballs bouncing around in space. They're not non-localized. They have a position. They're somewhere, and they have some kind of a sense of having a body. Now, there seems to be something, how shall I put this? When a human being dies and he leaves behind his mortal body, he still has a sense of location. He still has a sense of having a body. And, and I want to be careful. I don't want to use the term spiritual body because Paul uses that in 1 Corinthians 15 to talk about the resurrection body. The resurrection body will be a spiritual body, meaning not that it won't be physical, it will be very physical, physical, but meaning that it will be a body which doesn't have sin 
and in which we will live sinless lives. He's using spiritual there in the sense of obedient to God. But we could talk about a spirit body. And it seems that angels, like these dead people in the intermediate state, have some kind of a spirit body and they have a location. Now, the other thing that we know from Scripture is that they are able to take on a physical appearance and to interact with the physical world. Now, when I was a kid, there was a very popular cartoon, some of you may have seen it, called Casper the Friendly Ghost. And in this cartoon, there's this little white ghost, and he's going through life, encountering various things, and kids can see him, adults can't see him, and sometimes he flies right through walls, and then other times he picks things up. Now you ask yourself, well, how can he go through a wall and then at the same time pick things up? Because if he can go through a wall, why doesn't he go through the thing that he tries to lift? Now, it's only a cartoon. It's not theologically based, but it does seem to reflect something that is uh, part of the reality of invisible spirit beings. They seem to have the ability to take on a physical body, at least for a time. Now, I won't get into it now, but later in the course, we're going to talk about Genesis chapter 6, where the sons of God go into the daughters of men, and that seems to be some kind of physical interaction between fallen angels and human beings. And all I can say is that the evidence of Scripture is that under normal circumstances, angels are invisible. But they can, when they choose to, manifest a physical body and even physically interact with matter. That's about all I can say. Um, the evidence is there. How they do it, we don't know. All right. Uh... We have time. Yeah, we have seven minutes before we end okay. the question and answer. Before we take mm -hmm. the picture, um, I'll, I'll check. I'll go through several uh, easier questions. Does it mean that all ghosts are fallen angels? Oh boy, that's a that's a fantastic question. Um, quick answer is yes. There is no such thing as a ghost. If by ghost we mean the spirit of a dead human who is interacting with living humans. God simply doesn't allow that. Um, in fact, I've just written a book on that. It's not published on, uh, that, that touches on that topic. But yes, anything, any spirit that interacts with living human beings is not the spirit of a dead human being. And the only other option is that it's a fallen angel or a holy angel. All right. Thank you. Uh, another question. Fallen, fallen angels are also called demons. Can they possess people? If they can, then good angels can possess people also? Mm -hmm. We'll save that question for later in the course. It's an excellent question. All right. Uh, I think this, uh, this, there are several questions that uh, relate to Genesis 6 uh, regarding the, uh, the sons of God. Uh, mm. Would you like to answer those questions or would you like to wait for... We'll, we'll wait until we come to that. I've got a, a, an extensive section dealing with that topic. Also very important. Okay. All right. Uh, so everybody, we, we will skip anything re related to Genesis chapter 6 verse 1 to 4. Uh, can angels still rebel against God in the present, or it is a one-time event? Okay, that's a great question. Um, let's turn to Revelation chapter 12. And let's start with verse 1. Revelation chapter 12, verse 1. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, and the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then being, in, being with child, she cried out in pain and labored to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his head. 
his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. Now, we will talk about the fall of Satan uh, in a future session. The, we, we will see very briefly that the evidence of scripture is that all of the angels were created good that Satan was the first of the angels to choose to rebel against God's authority. And we know that there are many angels who have fallen and who are joining him in his, his rebellion. Now, if the statement here, his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth, if that is symbolic of the joining of other angels in Satan's rebellion, it seems to indicate a certain fraction. One third of the angels chose to join Satan in his rebellion. There are many places in scriptures that talk about the holy angels. I don't think we can pound the pulpit and say we absolutely know this, but the impression that one gets from scripture is that once that rebellion had taken place, the remaining angels who didn't join it were confirmed in their holiness. <clears throat> now, what I'm about to say is a little bit speculative, but it's at least worth thinking about. At some point, the scriptures come into existence. Now, they, the scriptures were written over a period of time, but it becomes very clear um, even in Genesis chapter 3, in verse 15, the verse that theologians call the Proto-Evangelium, that Satan is doomed to defeat. Let me read that verse. Speaking to Satan, God says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Now, a wound to the head is fatal, a wound to the heel is not. Once that prophecy was made, it was very clear that Satan's rebellion was doomed, that he would not be successful in his rebellion against God. And I think once that becomes part of the record, um, the remaining angels who haven't fallen would be very foolish to join Satan. It, it, it's almost as if once that statement was made, um, the defeat of Satan is certain, so no angel with any brains would join in him. Now, I can't, I can't really go further than that, but I don't know of any theologian, any expositor who believes that there will be additional um, angels joining Satan's rebellion. I think it's safe to assume that the number is fixed. Sir, let me have a follow-up question on that. Is, is there any fallen angels that have been saved? No. Um, the, the reason for that is a little complex, but I'll give it to you very quickly. In order for an angel to be saved, a member of the Trinity would have to take his penalty. Now, Christ took our penalty. He became incarnated as a human. He still has his human nature as well as his divine nature. And he died on the cross to pay our, for our sins. Now, it was possible for Christ to pay for the sins of many people because Adam's fall caused the fall of many people. In other words, the fact that we are a race descended from Adam made it possible for Christ to save all of us, even though there was only one of him. But since the angels are not a race, they're not descendants of some original pair of angels. Let's imagine that the Holy Spirit said, well, I want to try to redeem the angels. So I'm going to become incarnate as an angel and I'm going to die in their place. Well, he could only save one angel because the angels didn't fall in their ancestor the way human beings fell, we fell in our ancestor, Adam. So the bottom line is 
there doesn't seem to be any way to save angels, and there's absolutely no evidence in Scripture to suggest that angels can ever be saved or ever will be saved. Hello, everyone. It's 4.30. Do you want to continue? I have, I have more questions here. Sir, do you have the time to continue? Or? Sure. Sure. I got time. I have time. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to take more time than it should be, right? So uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll try to do it within 10 minutes. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, in movies, we see images of good angels and demons on either side of someone's head. Are they actually able to point good and bad thoughts into a person's head? Mm. Our bad thoughts okay. are simply a manifestation of our sinful nature. Mm. It's a very I good people question. Can, people can plant bad thoughts too, right? Well, <clears throat> okay. We humans are able to plant thoughts in other people's heads, but only through our actions and through our words. In other words, Humans don't have the power of telepathy. We cannot reach into another person's mind directly. We can only influence another person through our actions and through our words, through our facial expressions, things like that. Um, human beings sometimes influence other people by creating circumstances. You know, a classic example would be a politician who is an honest man who gets trapped by an opponent who sends a prostitute to his hotel room or something like that, right? We can influence people by creating circumstances, by saying things, by doing things. I don't see any evidence in scripture that angels have the ability to put thoughts in our minds. Now, let me say this, going back to Deuteronomy chapter 18, remember the passage where we are told never to attempt to make any kind of contact with invisible spirit beings? Well, what I'm about to say is based a little bit on experience, and we shouldn't build theology from experience, but I think the experience is backed up by scripture. I have counseled a number of people who have been deeply involved in occultism. And I think that it's really quite clear that people who have participated in occultism have, in a sense, broken down barriers that God has put around us to make it impossible for us to interact directly with the spirit world. Some of these people have told me that they can see spirits and that they can hear voices from spirits. And I'm inclined to believe that that is true. However, hearing a voice of a spirit is not the same as a thought being injected into your head. Uh, imagine this, this scenario. Um, I, I think about this from my youth because in my youth we didn't have the internet, we didn't have cell phones, but we had radios. I like to listen to the radio a lot. Um, if I was in a room and I didn't have a radio, I couldn't listen to the radio. Interestingly, though, the radio waves are passing through the room. In fact, they're passing through my body. They're passing through my head. But they go through and they make no impact because I don't have the means to receive them. But if you hand me a radio and I turn the radio on, I can hear the radio. Now, I think that people who have been deeply involved in occultism have essentially learned how to turn on the radio to listen to the spirit world. And so I would say that in the case of such people, it may be that they can hear things that normal people can't hear, but it's still communication very much as I am communicating with all of you right now. It's just that they have the spiritual technology to hear that most of us don't. So in that sense, I think that it's possible for angels to communicate with humans. However, 
let me say something and let me be very clear about this. Under normal circumstances, God does not use holy angels to communicate with people. Now, sometimes he does. We've got the case of Daniel. We've got some incidents in the book of Acts where angels do speak to humans, but under holy angels, but under normal circumstances, they don't. I think most of the time, if a human being is hearing voices that he believes from the spirit world and he's not just crazy, um, those are going to be voices of fallen angels. But, you know, the idea that you've got a good shoulder, a good angel on your right shoulder and a bad angel on your left shoulder whispering things in your ears, I think that that's not, not very realistic. All right. I think, uh, sir, you have answered uh, uh, several questions here uh, by talking about, because there are several answers that ask about the third eye, whether they can see the, de the spirits and all those stuff. Would you, add, would you like to add more or have you answered uh, that question? Oh, let, let's talk about the third eye a little bit. I, I'm not sure that there is anything in a human being physically that corresponds to the third eye. You know, some people have speculated, and this has no basis in scripture, that the pineal gland is the third eye or something like that. Um, but in many false religions, um, pagan religions, um, Hinduism to some extent, people are taught to see into the hidden spirit world. And I believe that it is possible to do so, but extremely dangerous. Um, and let me say one more thing about people who have learned to do that. Most of the people I have counseled who have been involved in occultism are people who came out of occultism and came to faith in Jesus Christ. And their interaction with the hidden spirit world very often doesn't stop immediately when they become believers. They bear a terrible burden sometimes of not having those barriers replaced. Now, I've actually seen uh, uh, people who've come to faith in Christ who had learned to use their ability to see in the spirit world for their own benefit. And there's almost a hesitation to give up that ability. It's very important when a person comes to faith in Christ that he renounce the hidden things of darkness and, and refuse to use those abilities and ask God to remove those abilities and to close those doors. And the sad thing is that sometimes, even when a person comes to faith in Christ and asks God to close those doors, sometimes spiritual harassment may continue for a time. So I, I just want to say to everybody who is listening, please do not allow yourself to be fascinated by the hidden spirit world. On the basis of Deuteronomy 18, which we've already read, any spirit being who will respond to your attempts to make contact is going to be an evil spirit being. No holy angel is going to pick up the phone when you call. And there is enormous danger in attempting to make contact with the hidden spirit world. It's sort of like your first tryout with drugs. You may have a great experience the first time, but you're going to get hooked and you're going to be in trouble. So please don't fall for that. Don't fall for that fascination. Don't try to do the spells that you see on Harry Potter. Um, just stay away from that stuff. It's very dangerous. Uh, are, uh, are evil, are, are fallen angels uh, working under hierarchy uh, with Satan as their leader? Okay, yes, I, I, believe, I believe there's evidence of that. Um, some of the strongest evidence is in chapter 6 of the book of Ephesians. Let's look starting at verse 10. Sir, would you answer that? Uh, in a, your yeah. latter sessions, or or should, um, or we can we can defer it to the latter ses sessions if you want. Uh, there's some more qu other questions. I don't think you okay. Will let's hold let's hold that for another question. Sure, give me another question. Uh, 
can can the great cloud of witnesses uh, is is that equated to angels? Okay, the great cloud of witnesses in Hebrews chapter twelve. Okay, um, hmm. this is also in my book. All right, first of all, the great cloud of witnesses is not people watching you. It's not spirits watching you. If you read Hebrews chapter 11 and chapter 12 carefully, the witnesses are not people who are observing you. The witnesses are people who are testifying to the faithfulness of God. And they testify to us by their experience. Um, so the quick answer to the question is they're not angels. They're the people who are mentioned in chapter 11 of Hebrews. And they're not watching us. They are telling us something. Okay. By the way, let, let's, let's talk about the word witness. Um, I, I can't see your hands, but I'm going to ask you to raise your hands. How many of you use the word witness this way? I was witnessing to my friend about Jesus Christ. Okay. I, I suspect that many of you are raising your hands. Now, you know what? No, you weren't. You were testifying to your friend about Jesus Christ. Okay? Witnessing is observing. Testifying is telling what you have observed. And an accurate, a more accurate translation of what we're told in Hebrews chapter 12 is that we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. And what do they do? They testify to us of the faithfulness and goodness of God. All right, so the good news is that you are not being watched by believers in heaven. By the way, if you're being watched by believers in heaven, they're not only seeing the good things that you do, they're seeing your sins too, right? That's the good news. They're not seeing your sins. The bad news is that the watching angels can, if they wish, see everything that you do. And they do see your godly acts, and they do see your sins. And, and by the way, that's one of the reasons why in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul reminds us that we should be, behave in, a ch in the church in, in a way that demonstrates our respect for God's established hierarchy. And when we do so, we encourage the holy angels and we discourage the unholy angels. And when we behave badly in church, we encourage the unholy angels and we discourage the holy angels. So there is a great cloud of witnesses watching the things that we do, but it's not save people in heaven. It's the invisible spirits, both holy angels and fallen angels. And, and just to be clear, Hebrews 12 is not talking about angels. It's talking about dead believers in heaven whose experience testifies to us of the faithfulness of God. I have two more questions. Would you like to take it, sir? Sure. Okay. Uh, in Psalms 82, uh, it talks about the divine council where God uh, called in the divine council. Are they, are they angels? According to the Bible project, they are angels. Um, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what else to assume they are. Um, the, the divine counsel is a little bit like the watchers, right? We, we see this phrase, the watchers in the Bible on a few occasions, and there's this divine counsel. As far as I can see, it's probably holy angels in the presence of God. But scripture just doesn't really specify who these beings are. and I don't know any other category. I mean, as far, as far as I can see, there are only three categories of true persons in the Bible. The triune God, angels, and humans. And so I don't know what else it could be. Okay, thank you. Uh, last question. Uh, when King Saul requested an audience with the spirit of Samuel, was it a holy angel or a fallen angel or Samuel himself? It was Samuel himself. <clears throat> and we'll talk about that later. All right. It was, uh, that's the final. I, I was yes, just going to say, 
the, rather than leave that hanging, let me say that that is the one case in all of scripture where God permitted communication with the spirit of a dead human being. And there are reasons why he did that. And we'll talk about that later. All right. Uh, thank you for all the questions. Thank you, Dr. Dean, for uh, teaching us. Uh, don't worry, your, your, your unanswered questions are, are noted, uh, and we'll raise it up once uh, we need to raise it up. Uh, Dr. Dean, can you close us with a word of prayer? But after, after, after the prayer, we ask everyone to open your video so that we can take mm -hmm. a picture. Okay, let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for my brothers and sisters who have gathered today because of their interest in your word and because of their love for you. I pray that you would bless them during this time of lockdown, that you would protect them and their families. I also pray that you would motivate them to go to the scripture on their own and to look at some of the passages that we've looked at today. Father, if there's anyone who has been listening today who is not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray for that man, that woman, that boy, or that girl, that you would give him or her no peace of heart until he or she comes to you on your terms by recognizing that like the rest of us, he or she is a sinner in need of forgiveness through Jesus Christ. Father, we we ask you that you would enable us to carry on with the remainder of our meetings. We pray that you would minimize the technical difficulties. And we pray above all that we would be strengthened spiritually and that we would come to appreciate and love you and worship you and serve you more effectively and more zealously as a result of our time in your word. This we pray through Christ. Amen.